A disclaimer for this episode. None of this information should be taken as medical advice as I am not a physician. I conduct all research, fact-checking, and editing to the best of my ability. Some basic information presented here is from my own knowledge. Sources provided in the episode description. An excerpt from the book The Emperor of All Maladies by Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, MD, describing Sidney Farber's experience treating childhood leukemia. August 16th, 1947. In a house across from the zoo, the child of a ship worker in the Boston Yards fell mysteriously ill with a low-grade fever that waxed and waned over two weeks without pattern, followed by increasing lethargy and pallor. Robert Sandler was two years old. His twin, Elliot, was an active cherubic toddler in perfect health. Ten days after his first fever, Robert's condition worsened significantly. His temperature climbed higher. His complexion turned from a rosy to a spectral milky white. He was brought to Children's Hospital in Boston. His spleen, a fist-sized organ that stores and makes blood, usually barely palpable underneath the ribcage, was visibly enlarged, heaving down like an overfilled bag. A drop of blood under Farber's microscope revealed the identity of his illness. Thousands of immature lymphoid leukemic blasts were dividing in a frenzy their chromosomes condensing and uncondensing like tiny, clenched and unclenched fists. On September 6th, 1947, Farber began to inject Sandler with teroid laspartic acid, or PAA, the first of Letterly's antifolates. Consent to run a clinical trial for a drug, even a toxic drug, was not typically required. Parents were occasionally cursorily informed about the trial. Children were almost never informed or consulted. The Nuremberg Code of Human Experimentation, requiring explicit voluntary consent from patients, was drafted on August 9, 1947, less than a month before the PAA trial. It is doubtful that Farber in Boston had ever heard of any such required consent code. PAA had little effect. Over the next month, Sandler turned increasingly lethargic. He developed a limp, the result of leukemia pressing down on his spinal cord. Joint aches appeared and violent, migrating pains. Then, the leukemia burst through one of the bones in his thigh, causing a fracture and unleashing a blindingly intense, indescribable pain. By December, the case seemed hopeless. The tip of Sandler's spleen more dense than ever with leukemia cells, dropped down to his pelvis. He was withdrawn, listless, swollen, and pale on the verge of death. On December 28th, however, Farber received a new version of the antifolate from Subaru and Kilty, Aminopterin, a chemical with a small change from the structure of PAA. Farber snatched the drug as soon as it arrived and began to inject the boy with it hoping, at best, for a minor reprieve in his cancer. The response was marked. The white cell count, which had been climbing astronomically, 10,000 in September, 20,000 in November, and nearly 70,000 in December, suddenly stopped rising and hovered at a plateau. Then, even more remarkably, the count actually started to drop. The leukemia blast gradually flickered out in the blood, and then all but disappeared. By New Year's Eve, the count had dropped to nearly one-sixth of its peak value, bottoming out at nearly normal level. The cancer hadn't vanished. Under the microscope, there were still malignant white cells, but it had temporarily abated, frozen into a hematologic stalemate in the frozen Boston winter. On January 13, 1948, Sandler returned to the clinic, walking on his own for the first time in two months. His spleen and liver had shrunk so dramatically that his clothes, Farber noted, had become, quote, loose around the abdomen. His bleeding had stopped. His appetite turned ravenous, as if he were trying to catch up on six months of lost meals. By February, Farber noted, The child's alertness, nutrition, 
and activity were equal to his twins. For a brief moment or so, Robert Sandler and Elliot Sandler seemed identical again. News of Farber's experience with childhood leukemia was beginning to spread, and a slow train of children began to arrive at his clinic. And case by case, an incredible pattern emerged. The antifolate could drive leukemia cell counts down, occasionally even resulting in their complete disappearance, at least for a while. There were other remissions so dr dramatic as Sandler's. Two boys treated with aminopterin turned, returned to school. Another child, a two-and-a-half-year-old girl, started to, quote, play and run about after seven months of lying in bed. The normalcy of blood almost restored a flickering, momentary normalcy to the childhood. But there was always the same catch. After a few months of remission, the cancer would inevitably relapse, ultimately flinging aside even the most potent of Yella's drugs. The cells would return in the bone marrow, then burst out into the blood, and even the most active antifolates would not keep their growth down. Robert Sandler died in 1948, having responded for a few months. Yet the remissions, even if temporary, were still genuine remissions, and historic. Many of us have been affected by cancer in one way or another. I myself had an aunt pass from metastatic breast cancer, and one of my old babysitters actually died of leukemia. One of my wife's aunts fought a neck cancer until it took her. You can ask almost anybody. And they know someone who has fought, or is fighting, with cancer. Recent news of cancer mortality decreasing is a triumph for our species. But cancer remains a horrible, complex, and ancient disease. Ancient because, according to the book The Emperor of All Maladies, ancient Egyptian physicians were the, some of the first, or some of the earliest, to describe tumors in writing. Humans have been battling cancer for thousands of years, and today we will focus on one part in this long history by exploring the early development of chemotherapy. Sidney Farber, the doctor who pioneered both pediatric pathology and the modern era of chemotherapy, is perhaps most notably known for the use of antifolates to treat leukemia. From his basement lab at Boston Children's Hospital, with few resources in the way of equipment, staff, and funding, Dr. Farber made a monumental discovery. Leukemia could be treated by starving uncontrollably dividing cells of folic acid. Some of you might be familiar with folic acid. Women who are pregnant are highly encouraged to take the compound for healthy fetal development. We will explore how folic acid relates to cancer treatment and the life of Sidney Farber on this episode of CT The Head. Sidney Farber was born in Buffalo, New York on September 30th, 1903 to Simon and Matilda Farber. Simon Farber was an immigrant from Poland who'd relocated to the United States in the late 1800s. Sidney grew up in modest means in a close, connected Jewish community of laborers and small business owners. Education was a top priority in the Farber household. According to the Emperor of All Maladies, quote, Pushed relentlessly to succeed, the Farber children were held to high academic standards. Yiddish was spoken upstairs in the home, but only German and English were allowed downstairs. The elder Farber often brought home textbooks and scattered them across the dinner table, expecting each child to select, a ma to select and master one book, then provide a detailed report for him." End quote. Sidney Farber was the third oldest of 14 children. Good lord. I had a friend in college who was the middle child of 11, and I thought that was excessive. Her poor mother must have spent most of her life pregnant. 
Those listening to this with kids, imagine your current living situation and the chaos your child or children already produce like it's their job. And now, add however many more it takes you to get to 14. Don't imagine that for too long. It's not healthy. When he was a teenager, Sidney was a witness to the 1918 flu pandemic that consumed many parts of the world, including Farber's tight-knit community in Buffalo. Now, many people are maybe familiar with the event, with this event, and know it as the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, this pandemic was caused by the H1N1 virus that affected or it, that infected an estimated 500 million people or one third of the world's population at that time. Of those infected worldwide, an estimated 50 million people died. About uh, 675,000 of those deaths were in the United States. According to several sources, that was about six times more Americans killed by the flu than American casualties in World War I. In fact, according to the CDC, in the U.S., the virus was first identified in military personnel in the spring of 1918. And if your memory is jogging, you may recall that H1N1 is also called swine flu, which scared the world's collective pants off in 2009, which, according to a 2013 article from Live Science, killed over 200,000 people. But those 200,000 deaths isn't even a percent of the 50 million deaths that occurred due to the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918. Of course, both medicine and infection control progressed significantly between 1918 and 2009. However, today the world is much more connected with air travel, making the spread of a virus much easier. Now, a portion of those 675,000 dead in the United States were in Sydney Farber's community. According to the University of Michigan's Influenza Encyclopedia, over 2,500 people perished of the more than 28,000 infected in Buffalo, New York. And the city spent $75,000, or $1.1 million in today's currency, to, quote, battle with influenza, end quote. Can you imagine that? Suppose 2,500 people died from a virus in your town. That would leave a lasting impression on most people. It's likely that some of those that became infected and died, Sydney knew. And I can only imagine that influenced Sydney to want to battle diseases. If you're a pre-med who has some personal connection to or has been affected by an epidemic, that experience could yield many talking points for personal statements and interviews. It seems the flu epidemic left a lasting impression on Sydney. He attended the University of Buffalo, majoring in philosophy and biology, and graduated in 1923. He attended his first year of medical school at the University of Heidelberg in Heidelberg, Germany, and the University of Freiburg in Breisgau, Germany. Since, remember, Sydney spoke German. He spent the remaining years at his, of his medical education at Harvard Medical School and earned his M.D., graduating in 1927. Now, according to Emperor of All Maladies, it was not unusual to travel from New York to university in Germany to Boston for medical education, as Jewish students in particular, quote, often found it impossible to secure medical school spots in America, end quote. Yes, anti-Semitic sentiment was alive in the United States in the interwar years. After graduating medical school, Dr. Farber attended uh, graduate training at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, which is now Brigham and Women's Hospital today. He trained briefly with a physician named George Minot, gaining valuable experience and learning the normal generation and composition of blood. Remember George Minot. We will talk about him again in this episode. Dr. Farber would later be appointed the first full-time pathologist at Children's Hospital in Boston. What is a pathologist? According to Johns Hopkins Medicine, quote, a pathologist is a medical health care provider who examines bodies and body tissues, end quote. Pathologists mostly work behind the scenes in labs conducting and reading lab results, examining tissues, etc. They help health care teams properly determine a patient's diagnosis. Working at Children's Hospital, Sydney was primarily a pediatric pathologist. 
According to the Emperor of All Maladies, Dr. Farber wrote both a study on the classification of children's tumors and a textbook titled The Postmortem Examination. The Emperor of All Maladies states, quote, By the mid-1930s, he was firmly ensconced in the back alleys of the hospital as a permanent pathologist, a doctor of the dead, end quote. Just so you are aware, my research for this podcast relies heavily on this book, The Emperor of All Maladies by Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. I would highly recommend checking it out, as well as the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Now, the thing about pathologists is they are mostly in the background assisting the care teams that see patients. It would be rare for a patient to see a pathologist directly. Test results are communicated by the physician the patient is under the care of. Sadly, if a pathologist is seeing a patient, they are probably dead. According to Saul Wisna on NYPR, quote, Dr. Farber was so troubled by the number of autopsies he was performing on young leukemia victims that after World War II, he set his sights on finding a way to successfully treat pediatric leukemia patients, end quote. Dr. Farber had a desire to not just be in a lab. He wanted to treat patients, and in 1947, he decided to focus on finding a treatment for childhood leukemia. Yeah, that would be inspiration. Performing autopsies on children sounds, sounds terrible. Before we talk about leukemia, let's talk about cancer in general. Cancer is the uncontrolled division and proliferation of cells. Another name for cancer is pathological mitosis, mitosis being the process of cell division. According to the Emperor of All Maladies, the word cancer comes from the Greek word karkinos, K-A-R-K-I-N-O-S, which is the word for crab. Since it was Hippocrates, the Greek physician who first used the term in 400 BC, to Hippocrates, tumor tissue reminded him of a crab. Yes, this is consistent with the horoscope, cancer, and its animal symbol, the crab. Cancer kills people by invading one or more, uh, one or multiple organs in the body and disrupting their function. This can occur when several cancerous cells break off from a localized tumor and enter the bloodstream or lymphatic system and travel to another location of the body, such as the brain. In 1947, solid tumors were treated with surgery or radiation therapy. Yes, very primitive radiation therapy, but that could only be successful if the cancer was local. If the cancer had metastasized, that is, spread beyond a localized area, or is non-solid cancer, like leukemia, surgery and radiation wouldn't help. It's kind of difficult to perform surgery on blood. Because leukemia affects the blood, let's get a basic understanding of what blood is. If you think you'll find this nauseating, of course skip ahead a few minutes. Most of us are familiar with what blood does. In simple terms, it carries nutrients and oxygen to our tissues. Blood is a solution, meaning it's a mixture of one or more components dissolved in a liquid. According to oneblood.org, blood has four basic components. Plasma, platelets, red and white blood cells. Plasma makes up 50% of our blood and it's mostly water and other materials. Platelets, also called thrombocytes, help us clot if we are cut open. Red blood cells, also called erythrocytes, are the component that carries oxygen around the body. This is accomplished by a protein in the red blood cell called hemoglobin, of which oxygen gas has a high affinity for. Red blood cells are circular and donut shaped. They are unique in that they are considered cells, but they lack much of the internal anatomy that other cells have. They contain no nucleus or most other organelles like mitochondria. The organelles inside the cell are like little organs that help the cell perform different tasks, and red blood cells do not have many of these. Because red blood cells lack this biological machinery, they cannot divide on their own. White blood cells are a type of immune cell. In simple terms, white blood cells help fight infections and detect foreign agents in the body. According to the University of Rochester Medical School, there are several types of white blood cells, and they are summarized as follows. I will paraphrase their function. Monocytes attack bacteria. Lymphocytes create antibodies. Neutrophils are first line of defense, or first line defense. They eat foreign invaders by a process called phagocytosis. 
Basophils pull the fire alarm when foreign invaders are detected. Eosinophils attack and kill parasites and cancer cells. According to a paper by the National Institute of Health, quote, upon tissue damage or infection, monocytes are rapidly recruited to the tissue where they can differentiate into tissue macrophages, end quote. So a macrophage is a monocyte that has left the bloodstream and entered a tissue to fight infection. Tissue, by the way, is defined as a population of cells that perform the same function. So liver tissue is distinct from, say, intestinal tissue because those two cell groups do two different things. These blood components are produced by our bone marrow. The Cleveland Clinic describes bone marrow as, quote, a soft, spongy tissue in the center cavity of all bones, end quote. I promise we'll be getting back to Far Sydney Farber. I think it's important that uh, we talk about uh, cancer and what blood is so that we have that foundation to understand what leukemia is. With this basic picture of blood, let's move on to leukemia. Leukemia can be described as blood cancer. Leukemia does not form solid tumors. It's liquid cancer. Leukemia often affects the white blood cells, hence the classification of blood cancer. However, recall that cancer is uncontrolled cell division. With leukemia, our white blood cells are not proliferating in your, our bloodstream because, like red blood cells, mature white blood cells cannot divide on their own. Where these cells begin their life is in the bone marrow, where they are produced. Leukemia is when the bone marrow produces white blood cells uncontrollably. Okay, so here's a leukemia overview, overview from the Cleveland Clinic. Quote, how does leukemia develop? Leukemia begins in the developing blood cell in the bone marrow. All blood cells start out as hematopoietic stem cells. Hemo meaning blood and poiesis meaning mink. The stem cells undergo multiple stages of development until they reach their adult form. First, blood stem cells develop into either myeloid cells or lymphoid cells. Myeloid cells develop into red blood cells, platelets, and certain types of white blood cells. Lymphoid cells develop into certain types of white blood cells. As stem cells in bone marrow begin to divide and multiply, they develop into all the needed types of blood cell. In patients with leukemia, cell growth goes haywire, and there are there is a rapid growth of abnormal white cells. These abnormal cells, called leukemia cells, begin to take over the space inside the bone marrow. They crowd out the other normal cell types that are trying to develop, end quote. When you look at images of these simplified diagrams showing normal blood versus a patient with leukemia, Normal blood is mostly red blood cells with some white cells in the mix. In patients with leukemia, the, the crowd, crowding out of normal cells is apparent because the bloodstream is mostly these leukemia cells. This isn't good because your body can't function without the correct balance of cell types in the bloodstream. According to the Mayo Clinic, patients with leukemia can experience fevers, bone pain, fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, infections, bleeds, etc., the University of Rochester Medical School explains that doctors classify leukemia by how fast uh, the cell growth is and by which cell type the disease derived from. Acute leukemia is rapid cell division. Chronic leukemia proceeds slowly over time. Myeloid leukemia develops from myeloid cells, whereas lymph, uh, lymphocytic or lymphoblastic leukemia develops from lymphoid cells. Leukemia was first discovered in 1845 by a Scottish physician named John Bennett, who, according to the Emperor of All Maladies, treated a patient with an enlarged spleen who was experiencing fever, bleeding, and sudden abdominal pain. The patient died of the disease, and upon autopsy, Dr. Bennett discovered the patient was, quote, chock full of white blood cells, end quote. And because the abundance of white blood cells typically indicates an infection, Dr. Bennett concluded the patient died from an infection. So this disease had yet to be recognized or named. This changed in 1847 when a German physician named Dr. Rudolf Ferkau named this disease leukemia. Dr. Ferkau was familiar with Dr. Bennett's case. 
as Furkow himself treated a patient with an enlarged spleen. After his patient also passed as a result of the illness, the autopsy revealed similar findings, an abundance of white blood cells. Dr. Freckhow correctly wondered if there was some uh, abnormality of the blood as there was no supporting evidence of an infection. For the next 100 years, physicians tackled cancer with surgery and x-ray radiation therapy, but leukemia remained untreatable. In fact, bone marrow transplants were not performed until the 1950s, but medical science would first uncover treatments for anemia, laying a foundation for Sidney Farber's discovery of chemotherapy. I should say it's really Dr. Farber's delivery of chemotherapy because chemotherapy, according to the Emperor of All Maladies, was sort of accidentally discovered during World War II when it was noticed by doctors that mustard gas would lower the white counts of the white blood cell counts of soldiers. And this inspired later physicians to wonder if chemicals could be used to combat cancer. In his personal life, Sidney Farber married Norma Holtzman in 1928, and they would go on to have four children together. Huh, he didn't want to have 14? Also in 1928, an English hematologist named Lucy Wills, recently graduated from the London School of Medicine for Women, traveled to Mumbai, then Bombay, in India to study chronic malnutrition in workers in an English-owned cloth factory. It was discovered that these workers, particularly women after childbirth, were severely anemic. Anemia is low levels of healthy red blood cells, mostly, most commonly caused by low iron. Iron is a critical component of producing red blood cells. George Minot, who I mentioned earlier, and his team had studied patients with severe anemia. They found that when their patients consumed meals rich in animal protein, their anemia abated. I'm talking about meat consumption. In 1926, Minot and his team concluded that the patient's anemia was the result of low vitamin B12. And for this finding, they won the Nobel Prize in 1934. For you chem nerds, vitamin B12, also called cobalamin, is an organic compound found in fruits and vegetables. But the best sources are, yes, found in red meats and fish. There are B12 supplements also. The chemical structure of this molecule is complex. Look it up if you'd like. One thing that strikes me, and perhaps you too if you've spent some time in organic chemistry, is the bound ion of the element cobalt in the molecule. Vitamin B12 helps keep nerve and blood cells healthy and helps make DNA. Now, Dr. Wills was familiar with the findings of Minot's work but found that her patient's anemia did not respond to diets rich in vitamin B12. Instead, she found her patients responded better to Marmite, a brown-colored sticky uh, yeast extract spread popular in the United Kingdom at that time, and perhaps it still is. Marmite, I've been told, it's pretty, it's gross. It's pretty gross stuff, and what you do with it is you spread it on buttered toast like jam. Now, I couldn't find in researching this topic why um, Dr. Wills gave Marmite to her patients exactly, but I'm guessing that because this was an English-owned factory and in the time when India was a British colony, that Marmite may have been readily available. Dr. Wills also didn't know why consuming Marmite reduced her patient's anemia. However, the, the critical nutrient turned out to be folic acid. Folic acid, also called vitamin B9 or folate, is an organic compound also found in fruits and vegetables. This is why you eat your fruits and vegetables, kids. And many of our foods are fortified with this nutrient. Folic acid, like B12, is also key for the healthy development of blood cells, and deficiencies of folic acid manifest in similar ways as B12 deficiency, like anemia. But only B12 deficiency can result in neurological symptoms like numbness and tingling in the extremities. Okay, now we come back to Sidney Farber. Aware of both Mano and Wills' findings, he knew there was some link between bone marrow, blood, and folate. Knowing that folate restored normal blood in Wills' patients, Farber was inspired to try an experiment. 
he obtained and injected synthetic folic acid into pediatric leukemia patients, and to his horror, instead of slowing their leukemia, it was accelerated. Farber stopped the trial immediately, but Children's Hospital and I suspect those parents were rightfully pissed off. Now, this is medicine in 1947. Patient consent was not really a thing then, so that's why he was able to just do this. Farber was, however, intrigued by the response leukemia had to the folate. He reasoned if folate accelerated the disease, maybe an antifolate would, this time, slow its progression. Farber would obtain antifolate the same way he got the synthetic folate, from an old friend named Yella Pragada Subaru, or Yella for short. Yella was an Indian physician and biochemist who completed his medical training in India, but upon moving to Boston, he wasn't able to practice medicine. So this truly impressive, brilliant guy got a job at Brigham and Women's Hospital as, wait for it, a janitor. But later on, he was able to secure a position as a researcher where, according to the Emperor of All Maladies, quote, he purified molecules out of living cells, end quote. He was able to purify adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, the molecule that carries chemical energy. But despite this achievement, he wasn't made a professor, probably because he was foreign. But Yella and Farber became friends. Yella eventually moved in, into a position at the, um, at the uh, pharmac- pharmacological laboratory owned by the American Cyanamid Corporation. Yella wanted to continue this molecule purification on cells for substances that could be used as nutritional supplements. In response to the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly making a ton of money on purified vitamin B12, Yellow decided to focus on purifying folic acid, but he found it difficult to extract directly from cells. So Yella and his team decided to create it from scratch in a series of chemical reactions. One benefit of purifying folic acid in this way was the creation of folic acid antagonists. In simple terms, this folic acid antagonist could inhibit a cell's method of using folic acid, an antifolate, just what Farber needed. Farber wrote to Yella for permission to use these antifolates on children with leukemia. The first antifolates arrived to Farber in the summer of 1947. So Farber used a couple different antifolates on leukemia patients, but the one we will focus on is aminopterin. How did this drug work to treat leukemia exactly? Well, bear with me for just a sprinkle of biochemistry here. Some drugs work by inhibiting the ability of enzymes to perform chemical reactions in the body. An enzyme is defined as a protein that catalyzes a specific chemical reaction. Think of an enzyme as a lock. Enzymes act on other molecules called substrates. Think of substrates as keys. Substrates enter enzymes at the active site. The active site is the lock's hole. When a key enters this lock, a chemical reaction occurs and We can imagine the key's ridges and contours change shape and exit the lock. In simple terms, aminopterin was a key with a similar shape as folic acid, so it had an affinity for the same lock that folic acid fit in. But when aminopterin entered the lock, it would block the folic acid key from entering. When the folic acid keys were blocked, they couldn't undergo a chemical reaction to change shape and feed leukemia cell proliferation down the biochemical chain. The results of Sidney Farber's experiment with this antifolate were extraordinary. In some patients, their white blood cell count would lower to near normal levels. For the first time, it looked like leukemia could be controlled with medicine. The drug worked, but to a point. Yes, Remissions of leukemia were occurring, but they were temporary remissions. Farber was persistent, and in 1948, he published a paper showing the results of 16 patients treated with aminopterin. Of those treated, 10 responded to the antifolate, and 5 of those children remained cancer-free for 4 to 5 months after diagnosis. 
Of 16 children, this treatment extended the lives of roughly 31% of them, even if for a few months. The paper was titled, Temporary Remissions in Acute Leukemia in Children Produced by Folic Acid Antagonist for Aminopterol Glutamic Acid. For Aminopterol Glutamic Acid is aminopterin. 16 patients isn't that many. A sample size of 16, I doubt, I doubt would get you anywhere in terms of finding rigorous, uh, solid statistical results today. But I, I have to emphasize how significant this finding was. Again, for the first time, it looked like cancer could be controlled with medicine. Also, according to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, in the 1950s, aminopterin was discontinued in favor of another drug, methotrexate, because it's relatively less toxic. Initially, Dr. Farber's paper was reacted to with skepticism by the medical community. I think part of that reaction was due to the understanding that leukemia was an untreatable disease and that such monumental discovery had been made by some guy in a basement lab with little funding. But both Dr. Farber's hypothesis and the resulting treatment produced a tantalizing result difficult to ignore in the history of cancer treatment. He hadn't cured leukemia, but his work is important because it showed cancers could be treated with specific drugs. This marks the addition of chemotherapy to the arsenal humans have against cancer. Dr. Farber continued to treat patients in his clinic at Children's Hospital. According to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute's history, a charitable organization called the Variety Club of New England, consisting of members in the entertainment industry, decided to support Dr. Farber's practice because, quote, he was a local scientist whose work offered a promising venue for financial support, end quote. The club established the Children's Cancer Research Foundation. Excitement of Dr. Farber's clinic spread to families whose children were suffering from leukemia. As said earlier, parents and their children flocked to Dr. Farber's clinic. One child in particular was a 12-year-old boy named Einar Gustafsson. During Gustafsson's treatment in Boston, he really wanted a television in his room so he could watch the, the Boston Braves baseball team. One of the Variety Club's leading men, Bill Custer, wanted to market this kid. It was decided that Gustafson should appear on Ralph Edwards' radio show, Truth or Consequences. Gustafson would be known as Jimmy to both protect his privacy and, according to the Emperor of All Maladies, Einar Gustafson, quote, was a mouthful of a name, end quote. On May 22, 1948, the show was broadcast from his hospital room. According to JimmyFun.org, quote, during the broadcast, Ralph Edwards spoke to the young cancer patient from his Hollywood studio as Braves players crowded into Jimmy's hospital room. The show ended with a plea for listeners to send contributions so Jimmy could get his TV set. Not only did he get his wish, but more than $200,000 were collected and the Jimmy Fund was born. End quote. $200,000 would be over $2.1 million in 2019 dollars. Listen to this portion of the broadcast in Jimmy's hospital room, courtesy of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Hello, Jimmy. Hi. Hi, Jimmy. This is Ralph Edwards of the Truth or Consequences radio program. Uh, well, I, I heard you like baseball. Is that right? Yes, that's my favorite sport. It's your favorite sport. Uh, who do you think is going to win the pennant this year? The Boston Braves, I hope. <laughs> Which one of the Boston Braves is your favorite player? Johnny Sane. Johnny Sane, the pitcher. Yeah. yeah, he's won 20 games twice in the uh, two years in a row, hasn't he? Uh, who, who is the, or more than that, who is the catcher? Phil Macy. That's right, Phil Macy, a member of the National League All-Stars team for several seasons. Have you ever met Phil Macy? No. Hi, Jimmy. My Hi. name is Phil Macy. Well, who is that, Jimmy? Phil Macy. Well, where is he? In my room. Well, what do you know? Right there in your hospital room. Yeah, that's uh, Phil Macy. He's from Berwyn, Illinois. Who's the best home run hitter on the team, Jimmy? Jeff Heath. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. I'll bet you can sock him, too. What? Who's that, Jimmy? Yes, he. Yeah. <laughs> right in your room there? Yeah. Oh, yes, that's Jeff Heath. He's second only Ted Williams last year in home runs. He's from Seattle, Washington. Well, what about the second and third basemen for the team? Who are they? Eddie Stanky and Bob Elliott. Hello, Jimmy. My Hi. name is Eddie Stanky, and here's third baseman Bob Elliott. All of us ball players are really look forward to meeting you tonight, Jimmy, and uh, we'd like to present you with some T-shirts 
with pictures and autographs of some of the very, uh, ball players on the Boston Braves. Man, isn't that awesome? They they got these guys to go into this kid's room and surprise him. I just think that's so cool. It reminds me of the what the Make a Wish Foundation does. According to JimmyFun.org, Einar Gustafsson battled with cancer his whole life until he died of a stroke at the age of 65 on January 21st, 2001. That money and other donations would fund the construction of the Jimmy Fund building, which opened in 1952. This would later become the Sidney Farber Cancer Institute. According to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute's history, Farber was an imposing but grandfatherly man. He stood at over six feet, sported a sharp gray mustache, wore custom suits, and knew how to match his temperament to each situation. He was very much in charge of the Institute in demeanor and stature. Aside from pioneering chemotherapy, Farber was ahead of his time in patient care. Former Institute President David G. Nathan, M.D., who worked with Farber in the 60s, said, quote, Dr. Farber came up with the idea of what is now called total care. He decided that all services for the patient and family, clinical care, nutrition, social work, counseling, should be provided in one place. All decisions should be made as a team. Everyone involved in caregiving should plan the treatment together, end quote. Dr. Farber's public appearances became more numerous in the early 1950s. He would testify before Congress to persuade them to provide more dollars for cancer research. He worked with Mary Woodard Lasker, an activist for biochemical research, to further expand federal spending for cancer research. He was truly a medical advocate and understood money's role in medical research. In 1969, Dr. Farber expanded services for patients of all ages, both children and adults. So was this prominent figure in cancer history interested in the day when we would cure cancer? Dr. Farber wasn't interested in speculating on a day when cancer would be cured. Quote, any man who predicts a date for discovery is no longer a scientist. We have a solid basis of accomplishment in research and treatment to permit controlled optimism and expectation of rapid progress, end quote. Listen to this clip from Dr. Farber himself discussing a cure for cancer, courtesy of WNYC's archive collections. There will then be no one V-day when the cure of cancer will be achieved. Progress will be achieved in spurts with great unevenness and irregularity. But the breakthrough has occurred in the chemotherapy of cancer in these past few years. Widespread cancer in the human body can be destroyed, even though not completely, and be markedly affected, even though temporarily, by the use of chemicals administered to the patient. And for the patient, there is the assurance that this activity in the world of research in chemotherapy of cancer guarantees to him that he will not be abandoned. Yeah, he says V-Day there um, in reference to, I think, V or V-E Day, um, which was the victory of the Allied powers over the Axis powers in Uh, 1945. But he was an advocate for both science and his patients until the end. On March 30th, 1973, an alarm signaled through the Jimmy Fund building, prompting staff to a high medical emergency. Doctors and nurses and scrubs rushed up eight floors to a far corner of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. When they arrived at his office, they found Dr. Sidney Farber dead at his desk. He died of cardiac arrest. In 1974, the Children's Cancer Research Foundation was renamed the Sidney Farber Cancer Center in honor of Dr. Farber. In 1983, one of the center's longtime supporters, the Charles A. Dana Foundation, partnered with Sidney Farber Cancer Center and became what we know today as the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Sidney Farber is considered the father of modern chemotherapy for his work in treating childhood leukemia with antifolates and publishing the results. Beyond this, he understood what needed to be done to sustain cancer research. He networked with and persuaded the right people to fund cancer research. He built an empire that, rather than existing purely for profit, fostered scientific progress in understanding and treating cancer. 
More specifically, he cared and advocated for a vulnerable population, dedicated to their treatment and survival, giving them as much precious time as possible. That's it for this episode. I really hope you guys found this interesting. I have a couple things to share with you guys before I go. CT The Head has a Facebook page. You can find it at facebook.com slash CT The Head, all one word, lowercase. On Facebook, thank you to the 17 people who liked the page so far. I really appreciate it. It makes me very happy. You can also follow CT The Head on Instagram at CT The Head, all one word, and lowercase. The next episode. We probably can name some of the worst and the cruelest people in human history. But who were the physicians that took care of these historical figures so that they could continue to terrorize their own people and the world? So until then, guys, be in good health. Don't go to China. Get your flu shot. And I'll see you then.